All right, in this video, I am laying out the 10 biggest mistakes people make when choosing a financial advisor. Recent research from Vanguard found that on average, a hypothetical $500,000 investment would grow to over $3.4 million under the care of an advisor over 25 years, whereas the expected value from self-management would be $1.69 million or 50% less. In other words, an advisor managed portfolio would average 8% annualized growth over a 25 year period compared to 5% from a self managed portfolio. There are a number of reasons this could be the case, and Vanguard outlines them really well in their white paper, like creating a suitable asset allocation, using broadly diversified ETFs, cost effective implementation, rebalancing, behavioral coaching, not getting too greedy or fearful, asset location, and spending strategy, meaning which accounts you draw from and when. I'll provide a link to the white paper down in the notes. The information in this video is for educational purposes. This is not specific financial planning, health insurance, or investment advice. In addition, everyone's tax situation is different. You should discuss your tax situation with a qualified tax advisor before implementing any planning strategy. Of course, not all advisors are created equal. Some adhere to the standards Vanguard lays out and some do not. So how do you go about finding a great advisor to work with? The first step is to avoid these 10 mistakes when choosing a financial advisor. Number one, hiring an advisor who is not a fiduciary. I've seen it too often. Clients come to work with me after working with an advisor who is not a fiduciary. The first comment is often, I always felt like I was being sold something. I wasn't really getting advice. By definition, a fiduciary is an individual who is ethically bound to act in another person's best interest. Fiduciary financial advisors must disclose potential conflicts of interest to their clients. The certified financial planner designation is the standard of excellence in financial planning. CFP professionals meet rigorous education, training, and ethical standards. There are many excuses advisors give as to why they don't have the designation, and I haven't heard a single one that is justified. In my opinion, if they don't have it, they aren't truly an advisor. They are either selling a product or may not have the financial education to truly be giving quality custom financial planning advice. If the advisor doesn't have this designation, I would run, not walk the other way. Number two, not asking about credentials. Hey, to give investment advice, financial advisors are required to pass exams. Ask your advisor about their licenses, tests, and credentials. This should be table stakes in order to provide custom investment and planning advice. Number three, hiring the first advisor you meet, even if it is a friend. While it's tempting to hire the advisor closest to home, a friend who is an advisor, or even a referral, this decision requires more time. This is someone you're trusting to help guide you to and through retirement. Take the time to interview at least a few advisors before picking the best match for you. All right, number four, choosing an advisor with the wrong specialty. Hey, there are all kinds of advisors. Many advisors say they can help almost anyone as long as you pay them. They're called generalists. There's nothing wrong with generalists, but generally they know a little bit about a lot of topics but may not be well versed on the specifics of a certain situation. Generalists also can be cheaper to hire, but a number of advisors have a specialty. Some are strictly asset managers and don't offer financial planning. Some specialize in retirement income planning. Some work with only business owners and some specialize in young professionals, doctors, or government employees. Find one that specializes in what you are looking for and specialists may cost a little bit more to work with because they typically understand their specialty much better than most. In some ways, it's very similar to getting medical advice. Your family doctor is trained to know a little bit about a lot of different things. Then when they understand you have a certain issue, like a heart issue or knee pain or back pain, they refer you to a specialist. The specialist often works only with certain patients, 
only does certain surgeries and is often in high demand because of their specific knowledge of that specialty. That's very similar to hiring an advisor who is a specialist. Number five, not understanding how you are paying the advisor. Advisors can be paid in many different ways, and sometimes it depends on the company they work for, how they can charge or not charge for their advice. Many advisors are paid as a percentage of assets under management, meaning they get paid when they manage your assets. This is a sliding scale that often adjusts over time as assets rise and fall with contributions and withdrawals and market performance. Some advisors charge an hourly rate, which can be good for a specific question or a project, but the structure often incentivizes them to take as long as possible to complete the task, and you often don't know the rate until after the work is completed. Some advisors charge a retainer, subscription, or flat rate. This allows you to know exactly what you are paying in an open and transparent way. And finally, some advisors earn a commission when selling you an investment product like a variable or indexed annuity or mutual funds. In my opinion, this is a serious conflict of interest and thankfully there are less and less of these advisors doing business today. If they accept commissions for selling investments, I would run, not walk the other way. All right, number six, not knowing how long they have been in business. In my opinion, when hiring an advisor, it's important to work with someone who is a little bit grizzled but isn't over the hill. Experience matters, both with investing and providing financial planning advice. The longer you are in the business of providing advice, the more you see. There is not a substitute for real world experience. You don't really want someone brand new to be learning on the job with your money. People make mistakes. Advisors do as well, and the less experienced your advisor is, the more likely mistakes are to happen. But at the same time, you really don't want to work with someone with one foot out the door. If they are constantly on vacation, if they move to part-time, or are getting close to retirement age, you may want to think twice about hiring them. Ideally, an advisor with 10 years of experience has seen a lot, but 40 years of experience may be too much. What? Too much experience is a problem? Well, that advisor with 40 years of experience may be set in their ways, not willing to continually educate themselves, or may spend more time traveling than helping you with your finances. Number seven, not knowing who you will be working with. What? Will you be working with that advisor, or a team of advisors, or a junior advisor? Again, you don't ideally want a junior advisor learning on the job with your finances. Find out who you will be working with and in what capacity and make sure you're okay with it. Number eight, hiring an advisor with too many clients. Studies have shown that on a custom one-on-one -on -one basis, a good advisor can work with roughly 100 families at one time, and that makes sense. If it's a team, then more families can be served. The less clients an advisor works with, the deeper your relationship is likely to be, and the more proactive that advisor will most likely be. The more often that advisor may be thinking about your situation, so make sure you are not just a number. Number nine, hiring an advisor with a history of complaints. You would think it doesn't happen, but it does. Ideally, you should ask your potential advisor if they have been publicly disciplined for any unlawful or unethical actions, and the ideal answer is no. However, there are numerous financial advisors with complaints on their records, especially if they've been practicing for decades. Many times, a complaint is unwarranted and can be dismissed. However, a series of complaints, a suspension, or something like that should be a red flag. Thankfully, FINRA has an easy way to check. That's by going to brokercheck.finra.org. Number 10, hiring an advisor you don't get along with. And this may be the most important one of all. Hiring the best advisor in the world doesn't matter if they are never available or you feel like they talk down to you. You want to work with someone who listens, who doesn't provide advice without knowing your situation, and is someone who can explain complicated planning in easily understandable and actionable advice. 
Now, according to a recent study, only 29% of Americans work with a licensed financial advisor. Why is that? I think a number of people have had some bad experience with advisors and they may have made one or more of these mistakes. I also think a lot of other people don't know how to find a good advisor or are afraid of being judged. Plus, there is a ton of free advice out there on the internet, TV, and here on YouTube. And while some of it may indeed be good, there is also a good bit of it that isn't and has unfortunately let people down. Hopefully by watching out for these 10 mistakes, you can make the process of hiring an advisor a lot easier. If you're looking to learn more about the type of advice a good advisor provides, I would encourage you to watch this video next to help supercharge your financial life.